My sister and I were raised by a single mother. Hey, how Look how thick her wrists are. You know she can cook. Period. Dot. The end. We had help from my grandma. Who I am tired of being filled like I took a fucking ride on that sister. I always felt this responsibility that I had to take care of my family. I'm the savior, the chosen one, the one brought forth to bring an end to the cycle of poverty. My whole life, I thought I was gonna make it to the NFL. I'm from Pontiac, Michigan. Football was a big part of my life. Big part. I caught my first interception at J.C. Park. I used to run the hills at Madison when I played for the Max Bears. I lived down the street from the Pontiac Silver Dome. It's so many talented athletes where I'm from, but so few NFL players. Barry Sanders made me fall in love with football. He was 5'8 and playing among giants. I saw that. You told me one time, Mom, I'm gonna go to college or am I gonna be able to go to college? And what did I tell you? Yeah, you get good grades and get you an education, get you a scholarship, you be able, cause we poor. I always knew we were poor, but I never heard my mom say it. We wasn't really poor. I mean, we were, we were poor, I'll just say that, but I made the best of the situation. She always took it as an indictment on her when we actually said we were poor. I always took it as a challenge. Like I've been trying to beat poverty. I wasn't the best player on my Pee Wee football team in middle school. The principal and the, and the head coach of the team wouldn't let me play. They said I was too small. In 10th grade, I got benched and then I just started balling. In 2004, I graduated high school and I got a scholarship to play football at St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana. My first impression of you was scrappy. I remember watching being like, man, I don't know if he's fast enough. I don't know if he's big enough. And every single time they threw the ball at you, it was competitive. Like you were just competitive, competitive, competitive. You made the most of your ability. And I think that was important. Football gave me feedback. There was no hierarchy, no rich or poor, it was a level playing field. I knew how to outsmart people, outthink people. I knew when I did something good. My coach would pat me on the back, the announcer would say my name, the crowd would cheer. I got genuine love from playing football. I haven't gotten that anywhere else. The fondest memories I have is you on the football field. The look on your face after we won the championship versus a nationally ranked Tiffin team. The look on your face after that game was over. I think that was, that's one of my best, like, emotional football memories. The interception, and you picked me up, you were so happy, and you was like, where my mama, where my mama? And you picked me up and, you know, put me up in the air, and I just thought that was so sweet, because you did, you, you, me and you, we enjoy football and you taught me so much about it and you just love me being there. To me, success only meant one thing, making it to the NFL. After four years of playing football at St. Joe, I got really close. I made an all-star team, played in front of some scouts. I had a pro day. I didn't take it serious. I didn't think that I could do it because nobody said, we believe in you. I was the only one, and truthfully, I don't know if I believed in myself. On draft day, I know exactly where I was. I was sitting in my apartment, on the bed. I didn't even register for the draft. I didn't know what to do. There was this big part of me that was never satisfied with anything because I didn't make it to the highest level. There are people that are born to do certain things, and if they're lucky enough to get to do them in their lifetime, they feel fulfilled. 
I wasn't born to be a football player. Now I used football as a tool to get me to where I am now. But as far as when it was over, there's nothing you can do in life. There's no drug, there's no plan. There's nothing you can do that can replicate actually going out there and playing. I played arena football for a few years after college and was making 200 bucks a game. They paid for our housing sometimes. And I just held out hope that somebody out there just saw my film and just gave me one chance to prove that I could play. I had nothing but my dream. I went to play ball in Missouri and I was just sitting around like thinking, what am I gonna do next? I emptied out my 401k and I started a business. I bought a camera. God, this is me, Daquan. I almost made a reality show, WWE Tough Enough. My name is Daquan Young and I am the next breakout WWE superstar. I got my first break in 2016. I just quit my job and I finished promoting a fight for a heavyweight boxer, Brian Mento. And I bought a green screen. What's up, all you quantum maniacs? I'm Daquan Young, and today we present. My green screen has been the most important investment I made in all of this. But it's also been my biggest cloak. I've been homeless four times. That's, wh that's why you always see different backgrounds in my videos. When I was 19 in college, my sophomore year, our house burned down back home. Being poor is embarrassing. While I was in it, I couldn't tell anybody I was homeless. Being poor makes you vulnerable to a lot of things. I've gotten taken advantage of a lot. Made other people tons of money with no reward except for the skill set. Being poor, you have no control. I couldn't make mistakes. I was always one bad choice away from being homeless again. Being poor, you always ask yourself, is this my fault? Luke Harper next to me, isn't he? You might want to be careful what you say on the internet, young man. And I use the term young very loosely. <laughs> that was real. <laughs> <laughs> in 2016, I enrolled in film school. Making movies was my backup plan. So with this move, I've taken the necessary steps to accomplish what I set out to accomplish in my film career, which was to become a filmmaker. I knew I could be a director. I watch movies every day. I love movies. And it looked easy. Take the pill. Yeah, show the bottle. Show me taking the pill. Fly back in bed. Cut to later. In order to complete the program, I had to demonstrate that I could make a movie. It's a story about a son who's on his way to New Beginnings. He's being He's supposed to be drafted to professional basketball team tonight, it's draft night. And along or throughout the night, he learns more things about his estranged father who shows up at his draft party. I've been working on this project for four years and that's the problem. And it's always been my excuse, oh, I haven't fleshed out the ending yet. I haven't fleshed out the ending yet. <laughs> I think people that look themselves in the mirror and are able to look at their flaws and say, this is where I'm weak, this is where I'm not, this is where I need work, this is where I don't. Those are the people that are successful because you can diagnose your flaws early. And I think that's important. I think those are some, some big things. The best I can do is be honest about this project. I thought it was easy. I thought I would wake up one day and be Steven Spielberg. I'm not. I had a script, I had a location, I had everything ready to go. And then I just sat on it, and sat on it, and sat on it. I shot a Kickstarter, it failed. I didn't have my dad come back tonight. I'm not feeling this. Cut! What's up everybody? We're on the set of my new short film, Profile. Then the pandemic hit. 
but it didn't really hit. I just made an excuse because I was afraid to shoot it. I was afraid to fail. I'm afraid to step out of my comfort zone and let people see me be vulnerable. It's harder than anything I've ever done. And I can't trust the feedback that people give me because people only see me as valuable for what I can do for them. With filmmaking, it's subjective. And I'm my toughest critic. The football came natural to me and I had years and years and years of repetitions. I didn't have to be emotional or vulnerable. I could just be angry and I'd be successful. What can I ask you? Did all of this, is it because your father was not in your life? Yes. When I played football, I was angry. Reckless abandonment is how I would describe it, which is a pretty good metaphor. I think pain is something that connects us all. And when I stepped on the field, my only goal was to inflict as much pain as possible. When I stopped playing, I lost that outlet. But I, I just don't believe in that stuff eating you up. I, I, don't, I don't think it, it ate me up at all. But I it just, caused you to be bitter. Yeah. I'm, but it but feel, you bitter it, with him. It gave me a chip, though. It, it, it provided what was necessary for me. To be a good football player? Yeah. It was, it was, I was fueled by anger. I was fueled by hate. I hate that man. Or I hated that man. I don't do hate you him still, now. You don't? I don't hate him now. How do you feel about him now? I don't have a relationship with my dad. I tried. I made the effort and I left the door open until I realized there was nothing there. When I wrote Profile, I wrote this fantasy life where DeAndre and his dad get a second opportunity because that's, that's all I ever wanted. You feel sorry for him? No, he made a choice. Yeah, yeah. And I had to make, the, I had to make that choice. Yeah. And what he said what to me. What choice did you What make? he said to me this summer. Mm -hmm. it, it 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 cleared all that up because had he had the knowledge or the wherewithal mm -hmm. to make a choice that mm -hmm. was better for him, I wouldn't be here. He mm -hmm. made a choice. Mm -hmm. And I think, be, like you said, be, sometimes being selfish is what you need. I'm mm -hmm. glad he wasn't selfish that, in that moment. I'm glad you weren't selfish in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We make the best of a, a, a bad situation. Yeah. I hated him for yeah. a long time. Yeah. Because I always tried to figure out why I wasn't worthy. Mm, you thought you wasn't worthy? No. You were. I told you you was worthy. I, and I get that, but... He wasn't worthy. That's the lesson right yeah. there. The last time I was homeless was at the beginning of the pandemic. So, I'm living in a motel right now. It's uh, May 15th or something like that. Middle of the coronavirus. And... Uh, I decided I'm moving to California. I'm searching for stability. I'm starting to understand film and shit more. And it's really exciting to see. Like, I think I've always patterned myself as an athlete and I've taken, you know, how I succeeded there and tried to put it into other stuff. And, you know, I see where I'm getting better and where I'm progressing. And, you know, I, I was always good at correcting my own mistakes. So I feel like that's how you progress faster and evolve faster is being able to point out what you did wrong and change your behavior, you know, before anybody corrects it. Because, you know, if you're not trying to learn yourself, 
you're not getting better. So like seeing everything kind of fall into place. I think of all of this like a puzzle. You know, I jot stuff down and it's like you dump all the pieces on the table and then you just put it together and you keep putting it together until you get the picture and then you start another puzzle. And I think that's what filmmaking has become for me and trying to understand this process. And I think it's kind of beautiful to capture and, you know, it makes me feel good to know that I have something that brings me joy again. Today is May 29th and I'm driving to California. I'm afraid, a little anxious, but I'm confident. I know who I am now and I've shed a lot of baggage that I used to carry with me. So I think I'm turning into who I'm supposed to be. Have fun in California. I we'll hope all your soon. hopes and dreams come true. <laughs>